Good evening. Thank you for being here in the session at DevOps. I understand I'm standing between the movie. Uh, so this is a, probably a different talk than you're used to at DevOps. This is a, a very speedy talk with a lot of slides. Um, I'm not going to zoom in a specific topic. While the title has reality as code, the word code in there, I'm not going to show code. I'm sorry. If you want to leave, that's OK. Um, this, the talk is about me as a presenter. Um, actually, I don't like to present. <laughs> if there would be a way for me to do this in an automatic way and kind of clone myself and type everything that I need and have this delivered to you in, in another way, I'll probably try to do this. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm happy to kind of socialize, but the talking as such is maybe always can go wrong, always there's something that I could have done better. So imagine I could ed edit that in a better way. So this, you see the chapters, and they will present a little bit of my journey starting when COVID hit and I was a speaker, I couldn't talk, and I was looking for more creative ways to kind of record this because it was no fun to be recorded and talking to an empty room like that. When you're in Zoom, I'm sure everybody has played a little bit with green screens, uh, trying to make their background a little bit more interesting. You tweak some of the settings, but in reality, it's, it's never that well. So I'm at home. What do I do? I get more lighting because everybody says your green screen will work better when you have more lighting. And then they say, OK, one light is not enough. You need five lights. OK, I bought like five lights and kind of tried to make this better. And then I needed stronger lights because it was not about the light. It, it, there's a decay of the light projecting its strength. So to make this perfect, I needed to have strong lights that light me up front, uh, on the back, on the side, so it getting a bit of costly. So obviously, you can go to some of these apps, and they will tell you whether your green screen is perfect. And I bought a green screen. And I can tell you it's one of the hardest things to get right that this app says it's OK, because the lighting, the evenness, it's a mess. And what they say is just like you know, development, we'll pick, fix it in production, we'll fix it in post <laughs> once it's recorded. It's, it's annoying. And I also learned that it's not just the lighting, it's also the camera. Because the camera, the sensor of the camera, will compress part of the image, part of the color, making it really hard for the chroma key to extract the green from the video correctly. So I was looking at an, a camera to do this correctly of a thousand euros plus. Again, ka-ching, it, it kept going. And then in the post, it's no fun because you would have to align the person and then kind of there's the rotoscoping. Um, luckily, things got a little bit easier in the, uh, from after the start of the pandemic. And now you're kind of just uh, clicking on the person, and it just takes the green screen away. Uh, amazing ML progression from compared to the manual green screening that you do in this video editing. And it just kept evolving, whether it's the object, whether it's the text, whether it's the scaling, uh, whether that's putting the light in a different place because I messed up the lighting. There is an app for that using ML right now. So I get the background removed from my chroma key. So then most of you probably put an image, but I wanted to get fancy. I didn't just want to have the image. I wanted it when I moved, the background would adapt itself. So I started looking into virtual production. Uh, this is an image that uh, is from the set of The Mandalorian. So I had high ambitions. Um, and 
The Mandalorian actually uses a game engine underneath to kind of have the rendering of the background generated uh, in a synchronized way. And so they, they're blending the green set, uh, this green screen inside of a virtual set. Uh, so you place a person in an environment. So that means if you put a camera in your game engine and that camera moves, it will see a different background. Okay, I thought I pr can probably do this, although the green screen of these uh, game engines is actually not that good. And it required, again, all the lighting and all the setup to do this well. Um, I tried a trick because I couldn't afford an LED screen the size of the Mandalorian. I, I bought a projector and tried to project the background behind me. So when I moved and the camera moved, at least I would get something. It's really hard to get the lighting there. And again, you have to buy a strong projector, which would again be very costly. So this is what the Pro do. Uh, again, I can't afford this. So I thought about another trick. I buy a 360 camera and I scan the room and then I get an image that I can place inside my game engine. And this is an example of a golf course. And then I put this in the engine just by having the 360 camera uh, in, in the game engine. Over time, this got way easier. If you want to scan a background, there's now a concept called nerves, instant nerves, where you just take six pictures and you get a 3D image like this. Pretty amazing. Again, over the course of starting the pandemic until now, a major leap in scanning the backgrounds and a lot easier instead of buying a 360 camera, I could do this now with my phone. But I told you I wanted to track the camera. How do I track the camera? And I found a person, uh, Matt, who's actually took his VR set and his tracker and had a virtual rig. So somebody could actually follow me with this camera, which doesn't have a camera mount, but it's just tracking the camera position. And then that will be the camera angle that is displayed. I have my 360 world where I'm in my green screen and somebody can film me. So how does it work? The VR headsets he was using are just VR base stations. They track basically through uh, infrared or signals the whole room. And then they know kind of where you are uh, with enough precision. This is not what the professionals use. They use more advanced things, but this probably works for uh, me at home but I would need somebody to hold the camera. So, annoying. So this is a track, uh, 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 sorry, um, something that's completely open source. You can build yourself with all the components. So if you want to do that, you know, check the link after the presentation. And this is how it looks like. He's holding the camera, somebody's sitting at a green screen, and this is the rendering in the game engine. Pretty cool, I think. And that same person actually building this rig was actually also on the set of The Mandalorian because he wanted to do it for himself and he couldn't afford the LED screens. So thank you, Matt, for kind of leading the way on virtual production for indie persons. So I got the environment, I got myself in there, but like I said, it would require somebody to film me and I would need to be there. So I started to look at a way, like, how do I scan myself and put myself into that game engine? And that's where meta humans come in. The first approach I found was find a lot of cameras and then scan yourself by taking a lot of pictures and using some software that basically creates a 3D model out of you. It's pretty cumbersome and it's probably once and it it is pretty static. So it's not that useful in the game engine. I could get a little bit more fancy now with my phone, which has a LiDAR scanning, which is basically a radar. So that could also scan myself. Instead of having me to take all the pictures, I would just use my phone 
around me or automate or I turn myself and then I have a better model of myself. But obviously that's kind of a very rudimentary scan and I wanted to start with my head, at least to look a little bit like me. This is not me, of course, but the idea is that I would take a picture and from the picture it would create a 3D model that I could use in the game engine to represent myself. And you think that's easy uh, until you see the pros cleaning up a scan. Uh, this cleanup of that person would take a professional person about a day to remove the wrinkles, to remove the, the, the incorrect scannings and so on. I'm nowhere in my lifetime still going to get near that profession, professionalism. So again, probably not for me. And with a virtual face, I will have to have virtual makeup. So <laughs> never ends. Um, of course, I can buy humans in a marketplace because somebody thought it was a good idea instead of having people sell, uh, kind of build their own humans. You can buy humans and you can buy everything, but looking at these prices just for the shorts or the pants, hmm, that, that's again getting quite expensive. And then even if I get it working with all the software they're suggesting, it will still look quite odd. Uh, it's called the Uncanny Valley. Even if it's really not good enough, then people will feel weird about this. Until Unreal, Unreal Engine, remember the game engine, brought out MetaHumans. And MetaHumans blew me away from the realism they are getting. It's not just a, a simple scan that we're doing. Okay, you can have it in different qualities. Um, but you can easily mix your own face in there with other people. So this was the first almost like realistic human generator that I found uh, from myself because it used an internal model that already was a face and I didn't need to clean it up and it was pretty uh, easy to use. And even I could select the body even if I didn't scan it, I could tweak the body kind of depending on the year that I'm presenting, a little bit more fat or less. And this is, I told you about the scanning of the, um, the scanning that only took a few pictures. Well, it turns out now with Insta nerves, there's a human nerve system that allows me to just take a few pictures of myself and render me as a 3D model. So again, cost went down, ease of use, a lot easier. And you can think like with all this realism, and then you got this post from Meta saying, these are the avatars, and everybody was laughing at them. Why? Oh, you know, we want realism, we, we don't want this. You gotta take into account that if you have such a realism, how much data are you having to send over the wire? So that's one of the reasons why they kept it, in a way, pretty limited. And also, if I move and somebody else moves from the model, there's a lot of data that needs to be transferred for me to show that I've moved to you and in the other way. So that's why initially the meta avatars are so simple. But Meta is not stopping there. They're going for a codec avatar. And you probably uh, link the word codec with video codecs about compression. And that's what they're trying to do. So they take the camera image, they scan it and translate it. They create a mesh and then that learned mesh will actually be sent over the wire. And once that's kind of known, then there's a lot of less data that needs to go over the wire. And just to see this, I think they released this video yesterday, your phone scanning in different positions, just from a video, and this is the avatar they're sending. So this is existing technology. Over three years, completely different field, thanks to AI and scanning. It's coming soon, but it's not that far off. 
So I scanned myself, but what's a body without me moving? You would just see a static mesh. So the next thing I wanted to do is record the, the way that I move, and it's done by puppeteering. So you see this meta-human model uh, on the left, pretty realistic rendering, but on the right, you can see all the things you can move. So if you press the hands, it will move the hands, press the, you move the neck, just by puppeteering this. And originally, very much like the VR trackers to determine the position, people have been using these trackers to also track the position of your hands and your feet and your waist. So at least when that kind of model is moving, it is more realistic. It's, probably, it's obviously not taking all the nuances into place that your body is mo moving. And that's why internally those models have something called the inverse kinetic model. And it's like they understand your bones, how they're connected. So if one thing moves, then probably your arm would move as well. So that, in that way, they understand the physics of a body, making it more realistic, even if they can't see, for example, your body moving because you're out of the camera partially, they still know probably how your body is going to move. So, because they can keep track of that. There's another way of doing this, just a simple camera using some computer vision for your position estimation. But you also see the same skeleton is there in a way to make this more realistic but it never ends. And that's also part of this talk. It never ends. Because then you want to have realistic eyes. You want a realistic lips moving. And so you need a camera to track this on your face. And you see again a mesh, how it's moving, and that will be how it's tracked. And then there's the tongue they need to track. So again, uh, you can move the tongue in many ways. And then there's the hair strands you, you're tracking. Um, this is the closest, if you want to do it like on the cheap professionally, you get a helmet, you get your iPhone in front, you get a motion bodysuit that tracks the movement. And this is probably two, three thousand euros. And that it feels really awkward if you put on the suit. You can't just use your normal clothes. And again, annoying. You can record these sequences while you're moving, and then you can start editing. But again, like the video editing, it's annoying because you have to do it step by step, do cuts, do changes. Uh, and again, of course, you can buy motions. If you want to do a dance, you just buy the dance. But again, costly. And then you want to track your fingers, so not just the motion of your hand, but each of the fingers individually. So you get gloves. Or maybe the new way they're thinking about moving, your, like what do you do with your hands, is kind of put something around your wrist and use uh, these electronic uh, signals to know which, hand, which fingers you're actually moving. So this is an advancement they're trying to do there. There's people doing this now live on internet, they're not called YouTubers, but VTubers, and they have this set and they just create this realistic self and they're doing it live. Again, live puppeteering is probably still the best way you can do it because if you're doing it through the model, it is not yet that flexible. But there's always a smart person in the room that then brings it to a simple camera. They put like two, three cameras on the field they get your body scanning, hooray, some AI, some ML, and it became a lot easier. Up until now, I only talked about the body movement and the lips moving, the mechanical movement. But I haven't talked about the voice, because actually, I want that to be aligned as well. And you all know the robotic text-to-speech things, but I must say it has really improved uh, the last couple of years there as well. And they look at a spectrum and then they translate the spectrum into waveform and then use that waveform to actually create the audio. So that spectrum, what makes it 
uh, useful is that the spectrum is very much uh, tailored to your voice. So it's actually sort of voice cloning that you're doing. But these phonemes, uh, I am your father, it's, it's kind of like the phonetics, and they kind of translate this phonetics to the spectrogram and the waveform, and then they reuse this to actually create new words you, you speak. But obviously, just having the recording is not enough because you might have different intonations. You might have different ways of pronouncing the word bird. So it's a one-to-many problem. So even if I were to type something in text, it generates some uh, kind of audio, I would never know if it's exactly what I meant it to be because it didn't pick up intonation that I do it. So I'm again, Rely, having to rely on puppeteering, not for my motion, but puppeteering for my voice. And there's a few editors that try to put the text and then the, you say the emotion, but it's clunky. Uh, and you don't want to annotate all your texts like this. I know you like Java annotations, but in this case, it's not what you want to do. Again, you can buy a voice if you don't like your own voice. Um, People have been using this in studios, obviously, if you're on a shoot uh, on a film set and you forget to record something, then you can regenerate a part that wasn't said. Or if a recording was too noisy, if somebody can re-speak uh, the dialogue, then you can also copy the noise from the environment. So there's various ways that people are using these text-to-speech um, to kind of uh, automate part of this. This was the, one of the last famous things where actually the Darth Vader voice was bought because they knew the actor couldn't probably maintain this in the future, so they bought the rights to the voice. Then I found another tool, like it was having to speak this, having to type this, uh, the emotions was hard. And I found Overdub, which is a video editor in a way that I record my audio. And just like text, I select an area, but I select it in the text. I don't select it in the video. I select the text and it clips out the video text. And even if I want to swap something that I said to later, I copy and paste that area. And using my voice, it will create the parts in between. And if I'd say too many times, uh, I can just do find replace uh to nothing, and it will filter out my uhs. Pretty nifty, right? But the voice is one thing. So imagine I can have text to speech. My lips actually need to be in sync. So there's something kind of like phonemes, which is the, the acoustic part. There's also the visual part. So certain um, kind of ways of pronouncing words, the P, I, I can probably predict how my lips will be. So instead of having to tweak the, the lips and, and kind of do that manually, I can predict from the text how the lips should start working. There's audio to lip. Uh, a tool that is just available. You kind of record your audio, it finds the words, and then you can kind of overlay this to different lip sets if you want, and then you can put this into your model. Because the whole lip syncing is basically a 3D model of your feet and everything around it. And imagine one day, I, I don't know if foreigners know this, but in Belgium there is the kind of AI song cost contest, like the Eurovision song cost contest. But if one day the singers would actually be starting with visual people as well, and not just audio. So for now, it's just audio, but it will get there. Because the next step is synthetic media. This is media that is just made up from other people, but from people that don't have to per se exist. And it is related to deepfakes, and I think by now most of you people know that you know deepfakes take part of the face, 
uh, you mask it out and then you render other parts and using uh, generative networks, you're actually making sure that the face fits uh, on top of that. After a while, you can't tell anymore what is real. Right? Is the left one the right one? I don't even know. I probably have it in my notes, but <laughs> I, I just can't tell it by looking at it. And yes, if you look really closely, there's somewhere a shadow, there's somewhere what is happening. Why are they generated like this? Because the easiest way is if your face is staring right at you, because they can do the cutting of the face the easiest. If you're doing it sideways, this will be a lot harder. So if you're ever doubting that you're talking to a deep fake on a call, ask them to kind of <laughs> rotate their head, put a pencil near their head, you're probably immediately there. I'm not joking, people have been conned by deep fakes for a lot of money like this. So it's not that far off as you might think on realism. And yes, you can also use it to generate unique photos because you don't like to have copyrighted photos and then you kind of make pictures up as you want. But it can also be too fake. This is a study of fake profiles from people on LinkedIn. And you see the exact spot of where the eyes are, where the nose ends, and you can actually spot it in this way because they're so similar how they were generated. So these people never existed, they're all generated. Maybe a nicer uh, application is lip-syncing deepfakes. So this is live translation from a person speaking. And we kind of do audio to text. Then we do text to audio. Then we do audio to lips. And then we take the lips to the deepfake. And in that way, I would be talking in Hindi, in French, all at the same time, using the same models. This has been used in Delhi, where a person needed to address uh, the nation with multiple languages at the same time. So this is something that's now available. You can do it even further. If somebody lost a relative, one of the things they sometimes do is they call the voicemail to hear that person. But what if we can recreate that person and they get to say goodbye. And what I'm trying here is to also show positive examples where deepfakes are used because they get so badly in the news, but these people, for them, it's really important to say goodbye. And they know somebody on the other side is not the real person, but it is important for their process to grieve. And you have also the live things, you know, virtual bands and influencers like the VTubers kind of doing this. But you're getting interesting things, like matches that have never happened on tennis. And people are playing against each other, different gener generations never met each other. And the deepfakes can also be used to actually enhance the 3D model. So remember we were building the 3D model by scans and, and it didn't look realistic enough? You take a deepfake of the real person, or the images of the real person, and you overlay that onto the model and then you get an even more realistic image. So this is used in FIFA, for example. And you know, there's conferences now for the virtual being summit. So <laughs> soon they'll have their own DevOps in a kind of way. And the nice thing is, be who we want to be. I want to be the person, I guess, on the right, where I'm at home, recording, presenting. I don't have to care how I'm dressed, how I look, and I'm just going to have like a stellar recording. And yes, I will swap my face maybe for a nicer person because I'm getting old and gray. This leads to technology like this. You type in the words, it creates an avatar which is speaking with a voice from you and all that. This is a product you can just go, Synthesia.io, go in, you present it, and that's done. So I find that mind-blowing how far we've come, and this is a commercial thing. And then they took it to the next level. They did it live. I don't know if people have seen this, but Americans Got Talent on stage at three cameras. 
with deepfake technology, kind of all singing in real time with a voice cloning, with a deepfake, and mimicking actually the jury. Like, real time, you have to imagine, real time. This is how far we've come. And now for something completely different. I was getting close to you all kind of getting the virtual avatars and doing things and scanning myself, but it was still an annoying for a lot of the tasks. Cleanup, rendering. Okay, so by now, I guess most of you in the tech world have heard about DALI. You type in a text and it gives you an image. The image, again, doesn't need to exist. It doesn't care. It just takes builds on top of so many different images that exist in the world, and it builds something creative new. Dali, okay, an asteroid on a horse, you can type in different things. But it might get things wrong, so things that aren't actually possible in the real world, although this could be possible, especially in Belgium, but <laughs> it is not something that's actually happening. And some weird stuff, like, you know, probably you never see uh, like in Skullwalker removing the sand with vacuum cleaner. So this DALI is part of OpenAI, and OpenAI is pretty much closed source. And they built another kind of way of interfacing this, querying this. Instead of an API, they used one of the bots, and they called it Midjourney. But then, lo and behold, nobody's going to stop with a kind of closed software. And there's always that one group that will think about making things open source. Thankfully, Stable Diffusion, they use a slightly different model than DALI, but at least you can download the software, you can run it yourself. It's going to take forever, but... So they spent, what was it, 600k dollars on generating the model. So good luck if you're at home, but at least it's reproducible. And you don't have to build the whole model to use it. So you can just use it, download it, and kind of generate your own images. And you don't have to rely on an API or get credits from something else. And so again, open source prevailed and it is now surpassing open API, which wasn't really open, to real open API. And you can even search the data set that was used, because sometimes you don't know what images are used uh, in the data set, and for copyright reasons, you want to know. And as you probably heard in many of the data talks and machine learning, the data that you put in will put, determine what is generated. So this is a set that um, of data that got changed for Japanese culture. So the left image in the, in the middle is a salaryman oil painting, European style, and then the same thing Japanese style. But they needed to have a different set of images to do this. And of course, the whole explosion after this, whether that's your Photoshop, your Figma, the, all the graphical tools all of a sudden had, like you don't have to design things anymore, just type the text and the image will appear. Well, almost. And they're able to do cool things. So you type in one text and then you type another text and then you type in other text. So first one, like a brightly lit room and then standing in the church and you just keep adding things to the scene. Again, pretty mind blowing. This is technology available for everybody. So this is not something you have to pay a lot of money for. And then it started to completely get creative. So you generate a baby Yoda, you generate a galaxy, and then you start connecting the images with the pieces in between. So again, first more stars, because you can never have more enough stars in Star Wars. And then you start removing things, so you let the AI fill the gap. Seamless transition between the two generated images. 
maybe a little bit closer to home, for the people creating storyboards, and they're always kind of annoyed that they don't find the image somewhere that they want to use in the storyboard. This was an experiment done. Um, a customer paying at the kiosk in black and white, fine line style. So think about it as a creative tool, not just for your Photoshop and so on, so maybe more closer to home. And we talked about the game engines, and in the game engines, they started also creating plugins. There was a wall in the game engine, and we just want to have a poster there. Type in the poster, what do you want, what style? Quite easy. So you don't have to do copy and paste of the image, or we'll look for it there. And then for brainstorming, maybe visual cues inspire you from one thing to the other. But it doesn't always have to be images, it could also be medical images. And again, maybe you need a bigger data set or kind of have things that you need to test. So this generative is not just confined to creative art there as well. What about the house? You always want to express like to the architect, like this is the house that I really wa want. So you start typing the text and it just generates the house style that doesn't exist because you can't find the image on the internet, but this is exactly what you wanted. You can go beyond 2D for 360 images, similar thing. And then you can do different things. With the text, you can select, type what you want to select to cut or to mask. Here you would type, select business suit. And all of a sudden, instead of having to manually select all the dots, it knows this is the business suit and can just say, delete this and replace this to a battle suit. Some more fun ways is kind of, you take your Lego, you build it, and you actually create an image out of this for your kids, realistically, so they know how it's gonna look in the real world. But even storytelling, one scene, I take an image, and then the story actually guides the image, suggests the next part of the story, and I can keep building on this. And even if I have in a scene, I'm a cameraman, and I have kind of one shot, I can ask it, how would this look from a drone? How would this look from a side? And then the AI start generating this. So, Otherwise, you have to go back to the scene and kind of start thinking about what did I not shoot there as well. So it's almost that this is a new job, prompt engineering. You just type in text and magically things appear what you actually wanted to have. And somebody kind of made the, maybe more from a pilot or co-pilot from, from GitHub, they said, Programming is starting to become a conversation with your computer. So you express the intent that you want to have, and the computer will actually try to generate what you want. So instead of kind of writing what we know as a real code, or hardcore code, or whatever you want to do, it, this is a new way of getting a result. There's meetups, there's a newsletter, and search engines, because you want to search for wall fears, then it gives you the images, and now you want to know what the prompts were that were used to generate the images, so maybe you can have better prompts there as well. You can always sell prompts if you have like a very descriptive thing there as well. And you can also have auto-completion. You type part of it, and then it suggests a lot of different styles that you can edit. So you get better at typing the prompts like a Grammarly for prompts. And then you have macros, because you group certain image and you say, this is a concept, and then I want to have that concept in my prompt uh, verified, uh, used. So I know cat toy was a bunch of pictures. I know the style that I specified had a bunch of pictures, and this is how they actually get to use together. So it's using concepts of, of kind of grouping of different uh, generated images. You sometimes have to, again, it looks too realistically or too strange or the uncanny valley. So sometimes you have to, it's useful that you give it a little bit of a negative prompt so that it's not that clean an image. And then 
Again, we're an engineer, so we want to reverse engineer things. Um, we have the image. Hmm, what could have been the prompt for this image? But it doesn't stop at images. Again, this is the explosion since I gave the last talk in maybe August. And all this, what I'm not talking about, is just brand new that came out of it. Google started to have text to video because why not? You have the same data. Meta couldn't stay behind. They have the same thing. But they can also create a static from a, a, a moving image from a static image. And you can specify a few images, and then it creates a transition from one image to the other. And you can have like one image, and it creates multiple variations of the image. But what about texture? Not just the movement, not just the image. And I want to say it's a shiny metal swan. So I'm, I'm specifying what I want as the texture used. Or maybe I have a video of a tennis court, but I want to change the background by specifying a prompt. This is things that exist, right? This is not like some random thing. This is really existing software. But then the same thing can be used to generate motion. Random thing all of a sudden becomes, I walk a certain way. And you remember that I had to buy all these motions before? Now I can just generate them from the images. Throws a ball, just generate it. And then I can give it a sequence. First, there is a realistic, photorealistic photo bear swimming. Then he passes on the water. And then I want to keep him swimming, and so on. So it's a complete story that I'm specifying to generate a video from here. And then from that image, you kind of have the 3D model. And you can change the lighting uh, to kind of change how the image is done. And you start with the 3D model, and you start adding things. So this is not anymore a generated picture or a motion or a video. This is a 3D model that I'm specifying with text. And I can give it different properties. How about this? I have an image. It got generated. And then I create a 3D version out of this. And then I start manually editing this in 3D, how the scene needs to look like. Whoa, sorry. but. This kind of keeps blowing my mind. And why stop at an image? Why not create a whole world? Because I, I took a background image and I did a 360 scan. <laughs> Just create a whole world. And so this is an example how video editing will start looking. Import a city street, boom. Make it look more cinematic, boom. Remove the object. So it completely changes this manual labor that we're used to of doing things. Maybe Google will start changing and it will just not ask us for a question, but it will ask us like, what AI do you want to have applied? Or what do you want to do in the future? And as always, the engineers will ruin it. We're starting with a simple prompt engineering. And you probably will end up with prompt flow, prompt lake, prompt queue. Too complex. But hey, let's enjoy the movement right now. This is a bunch of books I recommend. I'll keep the slide up later. To summarize, my simple journey of creating myself for a video is not ended. But I was amazed of all the things that I learned and how things keep changing. Um, when you're working, uh, let's say, a regular company, you have a form and an HTML and an API. This field is completely different. So I had to learn so much new things to get going. Um, I hope this actually inspires you to start looking at this technology, at the real code, and maybe start working and contributing to this. My hope is to have a conference about this here in Belgium. Um, somewhere in March or April, 
where I tried to get engineers in the room that can explain actually what was happening, what I've shown, because I just gave an overview of all the things that are doing. Uh, and I hope I can see you there. So you can follow me on Twitter uh, to get more announcements. And if this talk was of any interest to you, uh, please talk to me after the talk. And thank you for your time and go enjoy the movie later.